Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to our service. Would you all stand and turn to the people around you and just uh, welcome one another, bless uh, one another. Uh, what an honor it is uh, for uh, us uh, to approach God and worship him. Uh, our God, uh, he truly is good. And I pray that uh, you will enjoy this worship, uh, enjoy being close to him. And I, I pray that you would pray uh, for his spirit to inspire uh, all of you. Uh, may this worship be uh, uh, worship that is done in truth uh, and in his spirit. Uh, let's bow our heads in silent meditation and begin our worship. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose, we whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Dear Father, we truly thank you and we look to you for um, everything about our lives. And we thank you that uh, most of all, you've called us and you've uh, blessed, us, blessed us with uh, the grace of salvation. And as we live our lives as your people, uh, help us, Lord, so that uh, our lives daily uh, will reflect your character and your goodness. Oh, Lord, uh, through this worship, we pray for your honor, for your glory, uh, and we pray that uh, you would take delight uh, in this worship. Bless all the people that have gathered here to worship you. Uh, bless them with your presence. Bless them with your truth. Uh, bless them with your spirit. And, Lord, uh, let there be joy uh, in just a celebration of your goodness. From the start to the end, we pray that uh, you will be at the center of this worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's confess our sins before God at this time. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. O oh Lord, we confess that we have sinned. We confess that we have done wrong in your sight. And Lord, uh, again, uh, 
it is a it is a it is a confirmation uh, to how weak uh, we are. Uh, but Lord, you are stronger. Uh, your grace is greater. Uh, and so, Lord, uh, in faith, we approach you, we confess our sins, and we ask uh, of your forgiveness. We desire the peace that comes from your forgiveness. So, Lord, uh, reconcile us to yourself uh, by the blood of our Lord Jesus, and we pray that we may find uh, that peace uh, that is established between you and uh, all of us. Uh, and uh, we also pray that uh, you will raise us up so that we may be used uh, in the way that um, honors and glorifies you. So, Lord, uh, we thank you once again for your faithfulness uh, and your justice. Uh, uh, please forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's um, recite the Apostles' Creed at this time. And... Uh, let's confess our faith before God and uh, with one another. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hallelujah. 
nothing we can give to our God. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good time, God, what can we say to the king of all kings, the master of this world, the master of the universe, the creator of all things? God, we're thankful that, God, we can come into your presence to pray, to worship you, to sing songs of praise, to give honor and glory to you, God. That we can come into this place to draw close to you, to spend time in your presence to learn to become better people that can be used for your glory. God, we're thankful that we can lift up our prayers to you and our needs and know that you hear and you know what we need even before we say what we need. God, we're so thankful for the many incredible gifts that you've given us. God, we thank you for this church, for this place that we can come to peacefully worship and glorify you. God, we thank you for this church, for our leaders, Lord. We want to pray, Lord, for Pastor Thomas. We thank you for his many years of service for your glory. We pray that you continue to watch over him with his health. We know that he's been dealing with his back and a severe cold recently. But we thankful, Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that he has continued to serve you faithfully and serve us. God, continue to bless him and his family. Continue to strengthen and use him mightily for your glory. Continue to give him great wisdom and insight into your word and that you will use him as a beacon for your glory. God, we also want to pray for our leaders, for our lay leaders in this church, for our elders and our deacons. We're thankful for their many years of service as well, Lord. Some have served this church for decades. And Lord, we're thankful for their hard work and we pray for them, Lord. We pray that you instill in them incredible wisdom and insight and that every time that they make a decision and serve you, that it will be based on your will and your will will be done in this church. God, we also wanna lift up our brothers who have been elected or who have been nominated, Lord, to become ordained deacons and elders for, to serve you at this church. Pray for George, for Michael, for Albert. And in the KM, we pray for 
see Jin Kim. We also want to pray for Deacon Daniel, who has been elect, who has been nominated to serve as an elder in our church. We pray for all these men as they have been diligently preparing and training to become deacons and elders to serve you in this church. We pray you continue to watch over them, give them strength, give them wisdom and insight into your word, and that your teachings and your truth would prepare them and instill in them, and Lord, it would prepare them to serve you greatly for your glory. God, we want to pray also for Alan Jundazani, for his faithful service to our children, our youth group, our young adults. We're thankful that he's been able to finish with finals and midterms at seminary. We continue to pray for him and that you'll use him and guide him and strengthen him. We pray for his, his professors and teachers that are preparing him for a lifetime of service, Lord. We pray that you will give him all that he needs. You'll provide for his physical needs, his spiritual needs, his emotional and situational needs, everything that he will need to prepare to become your servant for your glory. God, we also want to pray for Hill Young Elementary School Director. We're thankful for her service to our children in our church. Pray that you will continue to watch over her as well. Give her strength, wisdom, and insight, Lord, to, to teach our children the truth of Scripture, the truth of the gospel message, and that our children will grow up in faith and come to know you as their Lord and Savior. God, we have many things to be thankful for, for the many things that you are doing in our youth group and our young adult ministry. We are hearing of such great things that you have done in the lives of many of our youth and young adults. Many have come to faith knowing you and accepting you as their Lord and Savior. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to move mightily through all of their lives, through every single youth group member, every single young adult member that comes into our church or comes to the activities that are prepared for these members. We pray that every single person that comes through would come to know you as Lord and Savior, that they would hear the gospel message and that they would be convicted of the truth of Scripture and they would come to know you as their Lord. God, we pray for their upcoming retreats. We pray for the youth group as they're preparing to do a joint retreat with the Way Church and for Vision Church, Lord, I pray that as they come together that all the youth groups, all those children would come to meet you and know you, that those that have already come to make a confession of faith in you, that their faith would continue to be strengthened. We pray for those that do not know you as their Lord and Savior, that they would come to hear the gospel message and come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We pray that you give them safe journey and safe time while they're there, that they would make great memories both with each other and with you as they worship and glorify you and come to know you. And when they, when they come back from that mountain, Lord, they will be so on fire and in love with you that the lives they live would be for your glory. We also want to pray for the young adults as well, as they all too will be preparing and going on a retreat. We pray for all the teachers and volunteers for both groups. We pray for the guest speakers, that God, you would ignite those groups as they come to worship and praise you together, that you would instill in them a passion for your glory, that they would love you even more and draw closer to you and to each other, and that we would be able to celebrate the many great things that you do through them, God. Lord, we want to thank you also for our missionaries and our NLMA association. We are here of many great things that you are doing through them, Lord, in Cambodia, in Indonesia, in Japan, and in other parts of the world. God, we continue to pray for our missionaries in Cambodia. We pray that you would watch over all of them, for their families. We pray that you'll be with their health as well, Lord and their individual ministries and collectively as they continue to raise up and minister to the natives in, the, in Cambodia, in that Lord, you would use them to raise up a new generation of leaders, of believers, the future pastors of the churches in Cambodia, that the truth of the gospel message would be spread to the corners of that country, 
and maybe into other parts of the neighboring countries of the world. God, you would use them mightily, Lord, to proclaim your truth, that many would come to know you. God, we also want to pray and thank you for the work you are doing in Japan with missionary Gaiman and his family. We continue to ask you to watch over them, their two girls, as they continue to live in a foreign country, in a place that is not too familiar with the truth of gospel message, Lord. We pray that you use them to be a light and salt in that communities, in their church, and that, Lord, you would watch over them in their health and their relationship with each other and with the community that they serve. We also want to pray for Scott and Helen. We pray for them as they serve in Indonesia. We pray for their two boys, Paul and Saul. Continue to watch over all of them, give them great health. Continue to use them mightily in the schools that they are serving, in the churches they are serving. And God, that you would use them as also as a light and salt to preach the truth of the gospel message to those in Indonesia that don't know you. God, we continue to thank you for the many great things you are doing in our lives, the life of our church. We pray that for this, this, this worship service, Lord, we pray that you will continue to move mightily. Watch over Pastor Thomas as he's about to preach the truth of Scripture to us, Lord. Pray that all of our hearts will be a fertile soil, ready to receive the truth of your holy message, Lord, and that you would use Pastor Thomas to speak boldly the truth of Scripture and the message that you want him to portray and proclaim to us, Lord. We thank you, God, that we can worship you in this place, be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and uh, sing the doxology song to our Lord and offer our offerings. pray one more time. Father, we truly thank you for uh, your, your involvement in our lives and the way you bless us. You are truly uh, our God, our Lord, and what we have, we have because you've blessed us uh, with those things. Everything belongs to you. And in recognition uh, of your lordship over our lives, we offer up these offerings. Be pleased uh, by these offerings. Remember the hands that have offered it, and we pray that uh, all the offerings will be used uh, in accordance uh, to your will. Uh, so, Lord, again, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, again, I want to welcome all of you to our Sunday service, and uh, I pray that uh, this worship service will be uh, a blessed time, blessed um, uh, worship uh, time for uh, all of you, and that uh, our God will be uh, honored and glorified uh, by this worship. Uh, we have um, a couple of uh, visitors, uh, David and Janice. Uh, they're visiting from uh, Fresno. Uh, Janice is younger sister of uh, Jane, uh, Deacon Jane, Jane Gipsanim, uh, on, on the KM side. Uh, they're sitting over there on my left side. Uh, if you could just raise your hands. Uh, let's welcome them. Welcome, welcome. Uh, let me highlight some announcements. Uh, so young adult retreats, spring retreats coming up uh, very soon. It's on the 26th uh, of this month, uh, 26th through, through 28th, Friday through Sunday. Uh, it's going to be at uh, Novato. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, location that um, uh, we were able to reserve, Novato, California. Uh, and our guest speaker is going to be uh, uh, Pastor James Lee. He's the uh, uh, head pastor, lead pastor of New Life Presbyterian Church in La Jolla, La Jolla, California. That's in San Diego. And so um, 
uh, please pray for this retreat. Pray for all the participants uh, and pray for uh, Pastor James so that, uh, you know, his messages will be relevant and uh, powerful and uh, that his messages, uh, you know, will uh, really bless us. Uh, so be with him. When he comes, uh, he'll speak for uh, the, the young adults uh, at the retreat site. But on Sunday, he will uh, speak for the KM as well as for the EM service. Uh, congregation, you know, meeting is going to take place in May, uh, in May uh, on May 19th. And this is to vote for uh, our new elder uh, and elders and deacons. And so if you are an official member uh, of our church, please be here. Um, your, your vote uh, will count. And together we will welcome uh, our new deacons and our, our new elders. Volleyball fellowship. Last week we made the announcement. I think I made the announcement that it was going to be every week. I uh, know, but it's going to be. That's not. That's not right. Uh, it's going to be every other week, every other Sunday. So we met for the very very first time last Sunday. Uh, to, so today no volleyball, but next next Sunday there's going to be uh, a volleyball uh, meeting. So um, take a look at um, the information there. And uh, again, the time is the same. Uh, the park is the same. Uh, and if you have any questions, please speak with uh, Deborah, Deborah Wei, or uh, Deacon Daniel Yang. Uh, young adult uh, group, they meet after uh, the EM service for uh, devotional and prayer. So uh, if you belong to that group, uh, please be there and uh, be blessed uh, through those meetings. Uh, EM, EM, just general prayer and small group meetings uh, take place uh, on Friday nights, uh, every other Friday nights too, uh, again. So on the, the 19th, this coming Friday, there's going to be a meeting, 7.30, uh, at uh, Deacon Tony and uh, his wife Jamie's place. Uh, youth summer joint retreat uh, will uh, take place in June, uh, the dates. Location, they're all there. Uh, registration deadline is May 24th. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody's signed up by now. I, I want to pray the adults, everybody else, to just, you know, pray for that retreat as well. Uh, pray that our younger brothers and sisters uh, will be blessed uh, through that retreat, uh, that the retreat will be safe. Uh, pray for all the staff, uh, all the teachers, uh, and also other students, you know, from, uh, you know, our brother-sister churches. And uh, we just pray that that whole, whole event uh, will be a blessed, blessed event. Look at all the upcoming church events. Uh, put that in mind. One thing that didn't go in here is that um, next Sunday, next Sunday, uh, we are going to have a, a missionary from Cambodia jo you know, joining us, visiting us. The whole family is going to be here. Uh, they are a missionary family commissioned by our sister church in Korea. Uh, and so uh, they're going to be here. Um, uh, the husband uh, is, is uh, an ordained minister, uh, and he's going to be uh, preaching for the KM service. For EM, he'll, he'll just be here to just say hello uh, to our congregation. So, you know, please pray for that family and uh, just prepare for next week. All the other uh, events are there. Keep them in mind. Mark them in your calendars uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Faithfully, you know, show up and, and be a part. Let's all stand at this time then for the reading of the scripture. Oh, I'm sorry. One more announcement. One more announcement. I forgot. Uh, it didn't make it into our um, announcement section. But that um, the date for summer STM. Uh, this is usually uh, the uh, short-term mission trip uh, done in English. Uh, the date is set. It's from July 16th uh, through 26th. And so, um, you know, if you're interested, please come and talk to me uh, or go ahead and uh, talk to um, uh, Alan, Alan Johnson and just let him know. I think I believe this year only two people are graduating because it's open f uh, to those who are graduated, and graduated from high school uh, and beyond. So from high school, we have two people uh, who's graduating, and anybody you know beyond that, if you are interested, uh, you know, please let me know or uh, let um, uh, Pastor Allen know. All right. 
Scripture reading. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 3 through 6. Exodus, chapter 20, verses 3 through 6. Let's read it together today. This is short enough. Let's read it together. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation, to those who, are, who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Amen. This is God's word. Please be seated. Uh, today's, today's message, sermon, is titled, The Only God and the Only Way. The only God and the only way. It's an important, important truth uh, that we all as believers must uh, always remember, must keep uh, within our hearts. Because if we forget this truth, uh, then we would be just like uh, any old, you know, religious, spiritual person uh, of, you know, this world, other religions. But what distinguishes us, one of the things that um, distinguishes us from other religions and you know, you know, other uh, thoughts of spirituality is that our God, the God whom we worship, uh, the God whom we devote ourselves to, uh, he is the only God, the only God uh, in this universe, the only God in this world. He is the only God and that he is the only way uh, to life. Only through him there is true life. Uh, in other words, uh, if you want to talk about salvation, salvation from your sins, salvation from your bad habits, you know, salvation, uh, you know, from the ways that destroy you, salvation from your sinful state and sinful being and sinful practices, the only way to salvation is through this God, God of ours. God of the Old Testament, God of the New Testament, Yahweh God, our God, he is the only way. He is the only God and that he is the only way. That's exactly what uh, God is trying to communicate to us through today's passage. Exodus chapter 20 uh, verses 3 and 6. 3 and 6, 3 through 6. You know, this portion, you know, of the passage uh, is basically the two, uh, very first two commandments of the ten uh, that God gave to the people of Israel. Ten commandments God gave to the people of Israel after he led them out of uh, uh, the empire, the, the Egyptian empire. And um, after he led them out, brought them over to uh, Mount Sinai, uh, you know, uh, God gave them his commandments. Ten to be exact. Uh, but of the ten, uh, the very first two, the very first two uh, is uh, or are, are the commandments that uh, we are looking at today. And uh, the message is that he is God, Yahweh, God, who delivered the people of Israel uh, from bondage, slavery, uh, is the only God uh, in this universe, in this world, and that he is the only way uh, to live. Now, this message was very important. I need you to know. Uh, and, you know, uh, you're going to see that it was very significant uh, if I explain to you what I'm about to explain to you, the context in which this message was uh, delivered to the people of Israel. Now, look, when the people were set free, when Moses, so uh, sent by God, uh, you know, took them, brought them out of um, the land of, uh, you know, uh, Egypt. You know, people were expecting, uh, you know, through that, you know, escape uh, for, they were expecting for uh, a better life. They were expecting that their lives would no longer be uh, a life of slavery, that they would have plenty of things to eat, that they would have their own homes, uh, and that uh, their living conditions would be so much better than, you know, how they were, you know, back in the days uh, in Egypt. Um, 
they expected this new life as free people uh, would be so much more uh, satisfying. So the land to which uh, Moses was taking them uh, to truly would be, uh, you know, a, a place where, where, you know, milk and honey would flow. That's a, of course, a poetic, you know, metaphorical description of how good, uh, you know, fertile uh, that, you know, land would be. Everything that they would uh, do at that place uh, would be uh, glorious, successful. Uh, that land would you know, provide them with everything necessary for happy life. So that's what their expectations, you know, were. And, uh, you know, uh, God, you know, that's, that's what he actually said to them. You know, I'm going to take you into the you know, land that flows with milk and honey. That was going to be, you know, a better place for you. So God could have just directly out of Egypt, you know, after they crossed over the, the Red Sea, could have directly took them, you know, taken them into that land. But instead, uh, he makes them stop over uh, at, you know, uh, the Mount Sinai in a foothill, footside. Uh, and, and, you know, you wonder why, why did he do that? Why did he do that? Well, one main thing, again, according to the scripture, uh, you know, was to give them, you know, the laws, laws of his, the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments. Moses, so, you know, while they were there, you know, goes up into the mount uh, and he, he receives uh, the laws, you know, from God. And two tablets of stones. Uh, he brings down the, you know, tablets of stones. Uh, you know, first time he gets mad and he breaks it, you know, uh, on the ground, you know, because of their uh, idolatrous ways, um, orgies. Uh, that's what uh, the Bible actually, you know, talks about. They were engaging in some really demented and, and, and uh, perverted ways uh, of, of engaging in some sort of spiritual worshiping act. Uh, they created for themselves, you know, golden calf and so on. Uh, crazy uh, in the sight of God. But for the people of Israel, uh, that was natural. That was natural. Did you know? And uh, you're thinking, what, what? why would that be natural to them? Because as far as we know uh, that we are concerned, that's not the way, you know, the God, Yahweh, would like to be worshipped. That's not the way, you know, we worship God today. So why would, why was it, why was it natural to them? Let me tell you why uh, it was natural to them. When we look at Exodus chapter uh, 12, uh, verses 40 and, 11, 40, uh, 40 and 41, we're told, we're told that uh, the people of Israel uh, were uh, living, uh, the, the length, you know, at which the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years, 430 years. For that long, the Israelites lived in Egypt. That's a long time. That's a long time. Don't you agree? I, I was thinking, as I was preparing this message, I was thinking of how long it had been since I, you know, immigrated to uh, the United States of America. I wasn't born here. Some of you, many of you are born here. Uh, I wasn't born here. Uh, I came here. I came here in 1976. 1976. 48 years ago, I came here. And uh, uh, in that time period, um, consciously uh, and unconsciously, uh, I've become, uh, you know, Americanized. I've taken on American culture, American practices, you know, American way of eating, American way of thinking. I've taken on the philosophies without knowing, consci you know, consciously, unconsciously, I've taken on the philosophies, you know, of this country. And I've been affected, I've been influenced, you know, by this country and this country's culture. Yeah. And I, and I think I'm, and, and you know, the, the thing is, I don't think I have been. I think I've, you know, to, I, I tell myself, I've kept my Korean heritage, you know, pretty well. But I find out that I'm far from being, 
a naturalized, you know, Korean, uh, you know, living in Korea. Every time I visit Korea, when I go there, I find out that, oh boy, I don't really belong here. I feel like uh, a foreigner when I'm there. I could speak the language well enough, you know, to intermingle, but uh, when I actually see myself and when they interact with me, uh, you know, deeply, more, you know, intimately, they find out that they find that very, you know, pretty soon or pretty quickly that uh, I don't live there. They'll always ask me, uh, are you from here? Oh, I knew it. I knew it. You're from, and when I tell them I'm from the States, they say, I knew it. I knew it. I knew you didn't live here. No matter how hard try. Why? I've been influenced. I've lived here in the States for 48 years. Some of you, you lived, you've lived here as long as I, I have. Uh, uh, but some of you less, maybe 30 years, 20 years, you know, um, 10 years. Maybe, you know, some of you much longer born here. Uh, but so compared to 430 years, it's nothing. It's nothing, right? Even the history of this country is uh, less than that. What, 200, what, 30, 40 years uh, is the, is the um, you know, length of, of you know, this country, United States uh, existence? Boy, but for, for, for 430 years, the people of Israel uh, lived in Egypt. And so, even if you live in one country, uh, even for like a few months, uh, you know, people act like they know that country. They, they belong to that country. My wife and I, she showed me this one uh, YouTube uh, uh, funny video of this one guy who, who uh, went to Japan and did, did like a study abroad for six months. Uh, he comes back to his town, he goes shopping, and he, he goes to, you know, uh, food places. And here he goes, oh, in Japan, the food is like this. In Japan, shopping is like this. In Japan, people talk like this. You know, it, it's supposed to be, a, a, you know, satire you know, of uh, how ridiculous, you know, that is. Well, but that's who we are. It's funny because that's who we are. We're easily influenced. Uh, we're easily uh, you, know, um, you know, convinced by our surroundings and, and uh, by the people around us and uh, by the culture, you know, by the philosophy uh, that we immerse ourselves in. Uh, we get easily persuaded. That's the point. Uh, even for a short time period, but for 430 years, the people of Israel lived in Egypt. And um, they were exposed to they were exposed to Egyptian culture, thinking, customs, food, and their religion, religious pattern, the way of thinking. You know, they were exposed to these things constantly. Even if they try to shut them, you know, shut those things out. Maybe you were brought up, you know, in a, you know, homeschooled, you know, type of family back then. You still could not, you still could not, you know, excommunicate yourself from the ways of uh, the land of Egypt. That was uh, what it was. That's the fact. That's the fact. It was clear that while there, uh, the Egyptian, Egyptian way of living, uh, so then therefore gradually became natural uh, to the people of Israel. Though they heard from their fathers, they, though they heard from their grandparents and, you know, about this, you know, great God, their forefather, you know, Abraham's story, uh, you know, all the way to, you know, Jacob, uh, Joseph. Uh, though they heard from their parents, you know, of this great God, you know, who, uh, you know, was with their forefathers and was supposed to be with them uh, even to that day. Uh, even though they heard, they could not resist uh, the influence of the land of Egypt. So uh, it became, you know, it was clear that it became, uh, you know, clear that the Egyptian way of living uh, 
gradually, eventually, ultimately, you know, it became, you know, natural uh, to them. Now, I could prove that by going to uh, the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 24, uh, verse 14. Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. There, this is what Joshua says uh, to the new generation of Israelites uh, about to go into the promised land uh, to wage war and take over, you know, that, you know, promised land. But there, we see Joshua, uh, before going in, you know, shouting out to the, the new generation uh, this. He says, he says, put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and then Egypt. And serve the Lord. Again, put away the gods that your fathers served before. Get rid of it. Get rid of the ways your fathers, uh, your ancestors, you know, why they were living in Egypt, you know, served. But serve the Lord, this true God who rescued, you know, you from that slavery, who is going to give you this new land flowing with milk and honey. The one who is directly above you, serve him only because he is the only true God. He is the only God. There's really no other gods in this world. Other religions, other nations, you know, they'll tell you, don't make it look like that there are other gods. But there are no other gods. There's only one God, one true God. And this God is your God. And he is the only way to salvation. Do you want to be saved? Do you want to get better? Do you want this, you know, new land? It is only through this one and only true God you will receive. That's what, uh, you know, Joshua was trying to communicate. Remember this one and only true God. Remember him. That's what Joshua was trying to, Joshua was trying to tell the new generation. Well, uh, he made it very clear. The generations before Joshua came out, he was the first generation that came out of uh, the land of Egypt. He knew that uh, his peers, the Israelites, uh, were idol worshipers. Uh, they, that they did wrong in the sight of this, you know, the true God. And so um, that was uh, the condition, state. Uh, of the Israelites at the time of Exodus. So they had forgotten. Some of them, most of them had forgotten about this, you know, Yahweh God. Uh, or their knowledge of this one and only true God was very, very limited. You could, you could safely say that they did not know uh, this Yahweh, Yahweh God. God of, uh, you know, Abraham. So God brought them there. Instead of just taking them directly to the promised land, uh, they made them, you know, God made them stop over, over uh, at Mount Sinai uh, and gave them uh, the Ten Commandments. And, you know, there are many purposes uh, to uh, the giving of, of the Ten Commandments, but one of the, um, you know, uh, very important, you know, one of many purposes, one important purpose uh, of giving the, the laws, Ten Commandments, you know, to the people of Israel was this, was to uh, tell the people, uh, give the people the knowledge uh, of who he really is. He wanted to reveal himself uh, to the new nation, his nation, Israel. You know, Israel before Egypt was just a family, family of people. But after Egypt, you know, it became a nation. That's how huge uh, the population uh, had, uh, you know, grown uh, into. And uh, uh, this nation uh, was going to be God's nation, new nation. And, you know, their king was supposed to be, then was going to be this God. And he wanted to reveal himself fully uh, to his people. And so he brought them over and gave them the laws. So that's one of the uh, most important 
you know, purposes uh, of God giving them the, the, the laws. Through the laws, because through the laws, the people were able to see the character of God, uh, to see his heart, uh, to see his nature. That's why. And of the ten, of the ten, the very first two uh, was critical. Because usually, you know, that's what you do. You, you want to say the very most important thing uh, very first. Yeah? And so he says, before you know anything else, before you... Uh, you try to understand any other laws, you need to know this, that um, I am the only God. You shall have no other gods before me. I am the only God. You are not going to bow down or believe or, or you know, like have in your notion, in your mind, that, uh, you know, many gods, that there are many gods. You will not uh, have that uh, nonsense with you. From now on, you're going to know that there is only one God, and I am that one and only true God. In Egypt, you've been brainwashed. Uh, slowly but surely, maybe in the beginning, you know, uh, your first generation uh, forefathers knew that I'm the only God. But while you lived there, uh, you were taught you were influenced to believe that there are many gods. Because that's the system, uh, you know, that, that was the belief system, you know, of the Egyptians as well as all the other pagan, you know, nations around. So I know your, your thinking is kind of messed up right now. Uh, you're confused uh, when it comes to gods or God. There are no other gods. If these people are worshiping these uh, various types of gods, they're nothing but demonic spirits. They're no gods. All they do ultimately is to demand your lives. They will abuse you, expose you. Uh, they will trample, you know, uh, you know, step on you. And uh, ultimately, you will receive death. There is only one God. And I am that God. See, God had that in mind. So you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Nowhere on this earth, nowhere in this universe shall you make any you know, images of, of any, any God or even me uh, to, to worship uh, and to adore. God was saying, I'm the only true God and I'm the only way to life. So therefore, I demand exclusive devotion and love. You will not bow down to anything else. You will not love anything else. You are to worship this God. His people, uh, you know, were to worship this God exclusively. And uh, they, they were to worship him as he revealed himself. Not according to the way they learned from the pagans. They were to worship him as God revealed himself. And, uh, you know, worship him. Uh, by not reducing him uh, to any created form or concept. You know, that was, that was the idolatry, the idolatry practice that the pagans, uh, you know, exercised. This went directly against uh, the way, you know, a, a common, you know, a person in that region at the time uh, would worship their gods. Uh, practice of idol worship uh, in that uh, you know, ancient Near East, uh, that's how people worship. Gods were often worshipped using idols or images made in the, uh, you know, uh, in their God's image, in the images of their God. That's how they did it. But to these people, now, I know you're, you're used to that, remember? They, when Moses went up and didn't come down for a while, they, they, made, uh, they made a calf out of gold. Uh, that's an amazing thing. I don't know how they did it, but they did that. Well, God is saying, 
you are not going to worship me like that. You are not going to, you know, make me who is infinite uh, into something finite and, and try to worship me. You are not going to worship me like that. Uh, and you are not going to worship me as one of the one of the gods. No. You are going to worship me. You are going to adore me. Uh, you are going to be devoted to me. You are going to be loving me exclusively. Because that's who I am. I am exclusive to those whom I choose to love. I am exclusively theirs. I am exclusively, uh, you know, their king. And so that is how you are to worship me. It was uh, an amazing, revolutionary, you know, uh, revelation uh, that the people of Israel received uh, at the mount, uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai, you know. Right now, you don't think it's amazing because, you know, we, 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 God has made it so easy for us uh, in many ways, so we take for granted but uh, you know, what God gave us uh, through uh, the people of Israel, uh, you know, uh, is a great, a great blessing for him to be our exclusive God uh, and for us to belong to him. That, and, and that there are no other gods, you know, uh, to, to attack us, to influence us, or, or to take us captive. What an amazing, amazing revelation. You find out as Christians that uh, whatever, whatever spirituality that's out there in this world is demonic in nature. No matter how good they may sound like. At the end of the day, these things are demonic in nature. You find out that in Jesus Christ, that the demons, the angels who used to be angels fallen have, you know, come on to this earth. And is, you know, going about, roaming about, and ruling about uh, the people of this place. And at one point, you know, we're told uh, that these fallen angels, you know, you know Satan uh, is roaming, uh, you know, around like a roaring lion to devour, uh, you know, its victims, praise. Look, Bible uses a lot of, you know, you know metaphors, figure of speech to convey uh, you know, the spiritual realities so that we could understand. Uh, and um, uh, that is you know, exactly what you know, God does here too in today's passage. Um, you shall not bow down to them uh, or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, uh, visiting the iniquity of the fathers uh, on the children to the third and the fourth generation, uh, to those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those uh, who love me and keep my commandments. Here, uh, God is speaking to the people. Uh, he spoke to the people of Israel and is speaking to us uh, metaphorically. Uh, we use a very hard theological uh, you know, term for something like this. And maybe you should know because it comes out a lot when you read through the Bible. Um, anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic uh, is the word um, that may perhaps you, you should know. Uh, it's, it's a literary device uh, that writers, especially, you know, uh, poets use uh, to, to describe things so that you as a human being uh, could understand better, receive better. Uh, uh, anthropomorphism is, is, is a skill in which, um, you know, non-living things, non-human things uh, are given human features uh, so that, you know, you, you could uh, kind of understand, have feelings, you know, for those things. So here, when, when God is described to be a jealous God, uh, we all would know. We all would know. We know we've, we've felt jealousy. You know, you, you love somebody so much, but if that person, uh, you know, is, says, you know, they love you, he or she, you know, uh, loves you, but, you know, goes off and, and, and gives their devotion and love to others, the jealousy, jealousy, you know, you know, the feeling of that jealousy, how strong, you know, of a feeling that is, you know that. And that's the, 
message um, uh, that is trying to uh, that is being communicated to to the readers. Your God, this one and only true God, He is devoted to you so much so that when you turn your you know heads to other things, uh, all these faulty gods, uh, that's how strong of an emotion uh, you know God has you know for you. That's how devoted he is to you. That's what, uh, you know, the writer is trying to convey. And, uh, you know, when it talks about, you know, like curse being, being given to those, you know, who uh, shun God and turn their backs on God uh, and, and their, you know, curse being, you know, handed over, third gen- over to third generation, fourth generation, uh, versus blessings, you know, grace uh, that is given over to those who, who love to thousand generation. It's not that this is literally three generation, four generation, and then it stops, and then thousand generation, and then it stops. It's not a literal number, but it is a number that shows the comparison between God's grace over uh, his desire to curse, you see? Um, that is being conveyed, conveyed, uh, you know, to all of us today. What God wants or wanted the people of Israel to know, and what He wants to wants us to know today. So, therefore, through His commandments, but especially through the very first two, is that He is the only God. He is the only way. Don't look to other things, uh, other you know ways or methods. Uh, for salvation. Gosh, I had to go through all of that to now uh, make this point now. Final point, and it's this. Look, uh, I run into people uh, quite often who, who tell me, and, and, you know, they think they're very noble because they're, they're you know, holding on to, you know, that view uh, about, you know, spirituality and religion and, and God. Uh, but, you know, I got to say that, that uh, it's completely, you know, untrue that it is not biblical, and it's this. They often tell me, and I just ran into one, um, uh, they'll tell me, first, they'll ask, you know, what I do. Uh, They find out that I'm a pastor, uh, and uh, they say, oh, you know, I'm spiritual too. Uh, You know, I used to go to church, but, you know, I don't go anymore. But I like to visit churches. I like to visit, you know, temples. I, you know, I like all the other religions, many religions, you know, of this world, uh, this one person that I met uh, just recently told me, oh, you know, she, she likes to go to, you know, uh, temple. She likes the teachings of Buddha. Uh, and, and, you know, so I said, oh, so that's fine. Okay. Good. Okay, good. <laughs> what am I going to say? Because uh, uh, I wasn't about to, you know, to argue with the person. Um, oh, well, that's what you believe. That's fine. Uh, but... Um, uh, you know, I, I will see her again. I will see her again. Uh, and I'm just going to find the right moment to kind of uh, explain to her uh, what the Christian view is. But the thing is, uh, she thinks, you know, Christianity is, is also like that. Uh, it's also like that. that. That it's open to all the other religions of the world, all the other gods of this world. A lot of Christians uh, maybe not our denomination, but like many denominations, other denominations, you know, uh, they believe in this sort of ecumenical, multi-God, polytheistic, uh, you know, uh, way of believing God. Yeah. Uh, you even find that, even you even find that, uh, one example is, you know, Roman Catholic, you know, Catholicism, uh, there too, like opening up to other religions and so on uh, became a huge, you know, fad. Uh, in the um, uh, 80s and the 90s and, and so on. Uh, I don't know what it is now, but uh, ecumenicalism, uh, you know, has always been big. And even now, it's big uh, in, in a lot of the liberal uh, um, denominations. What is that? That is being just like the people of Israel who came out of Egypt. Not remembering, not recognizing, you know, who 
you know, our God truly is. He is one. He is the only one. He is the only true God. And only through him there is salvation. The lady told me that, oh, you know, I believe that uh, uh, not only through Christianity, at the end of the day when we all die, you know, we'll come together and find out that all these different religions and their gods uh, and, and Christian God, they all turn out to be probably the same God. And uh, I, I, I actually don't blame her much. Uh, she, I believe, was saying that because she, she doesn't know, uh, just like the people uh, of Israel. Before, before I, I was converted, uh, I went to church uh, as a child, ever since I was, I was a child. But I thought the same thing too, same way too. Because that, that seems to be fair, that's why. That seems to be the uh, politically correct you know, because we're all about you know, being correct these days, right? And being uh, a product of postmodern, uh, you know, uh, you know, philosophy, postmodernism. You know, we want to give everybody the, the equal chance ideas, relatively speaking. Everybody has their own truths, right? And so I remember as, as, as a kid, I used to think, oh, yeah, you know, all these other religions are fine. They probably at the end, they all going to be turned out to be. You know, the same God. It's a, it's a clever idea, but because people would be thinking that way, God made it very clear from the very, very first day, day one. Look, if you're going to be my people, you're going to know that I am the only God. There are no other gods. Uh, people may think that way, and you might actually be tempted to think that way, so that uh, when it gets hard with me, that you might turn to some other God or other ways uh, for salvation or solutions. But, but I'm here to tell you, uh, if you turn away, if you go you know, to some other gods, uh, there's only destruction at the end. True life could only be found in me and me alone. I am the only God. You need to know that. You see, that was God's intention. And that is God's intention when he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to this world 2,000 years ago. And for him to die on the cross. Last week, I, I talked about some of the things that we could find uh, as we reflect upon uh, uh, the cross of Jesus. Well, this is one of the things uh, that the cross of Jesus Christ tells us. That, that there is only one God. And that there is only one way to salvation. Because if there were many other ways, God would not have chosen this horrible way huh, of sacrificing his one and only son to die on the cross like that. If there are other ways, there are easier ways, then he would not have done that. He would have just said, oh, if you can you know, handle you know, what I'm co commanding you to do, Maybe go try something else because ultimately in the end, you know, I'm the God of Buddhism. I'm the God of, you know, the Islam. I'm the God of, you know, Mormons. I'm the God of Jehovah's Witnesses because I'm the God of all religions. See, God is saying that is not the way. That is not true. All the other religions of the world, those religions are led by the demonic spirits. Only I am the true God of the universe. I am the only true Lord uh, of all things. You must believe in me. You must belong to me. You must, you must trust me. There are no other ways. And that's what the cross is all about. Uh, that was... Uh, what Jesus Christ uh, also uh, communicated. John 14, 6, very famous passage. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. So the teaching was, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There's only one way, one way Jesus Christ 
Jesus Christ is the culmination, manifestation, then therefore, of the Old Testament, Yahweh God. And the very two commandments of God given to the people to reveal himself, Jesus Christ will fe- would be the fulfillment, you know, of all of that. And he is uh, speaking to all of us as well as, as he spoke to the people 2,000 years ago. He is speaking to you. Only one God, only one way, only through me that you will have life. Idol worship? You say, oh, I don't worship idols. I don't worship other gods. You know, I don't set up, you know, these things, carved images and so on. No? Yeah, I know you don't, literally. But mentally, spiritually, uh, oftentimes uh, not in a material way, invisibly, uh, you do that. Tim Keller, uh, he actually talks about this, uh, you know, uh, in his book about, you know, uh, idol worship or what idol worship is. Uh, in, in a lot of his, you know, writings, he talks about that. And he says, you know what idol worship is at the end of the day? Idol worship is, uh, you know, when a person makes something kind of normal and neutral and at times even good, when, some, when, when a person turns something other than God into ultimate things ultimate things for their lives. Uh, That is, that's when, you know, uh, they engage in idol worship. And that is so true. How many of you uh, really uh, love your parents, love your children, uh, love your wife, love your husband? Those things are all good, yeah? Appreciating your jobs, and, and appreciating the money that you make and, and the car that you drive and home. Those things are all, you know, good things. It turns into bad things when you turn those things into ultimate things. When you turn your children into ultimate things, then your children, uh, you know, worshiping people. If you turn your husband uh, into your ultimate, you know, thing, then you're worshiping your husband. Uh, I don't know how many wives are doing that these days. Uh, husband worshipers. How many of you ladies are husband no. Wife worshipers? There may be few. There may be few. <laughs> um, but not only that, job worshipers, huh? money worshipers, car worshipers, house worshipers. People turn so many ridiculous things into ultimate things. They forget what God said to the people of Israel. Uh, They forget what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. Letting us know with his life that there is only one way. One way. Jesus is the only God that you ought to have. Don't put your hope uh, in other things. We have to remember that uh, we are just like the Israelites. We tend to point our fingers at the people of Israel, but we are just like them. We're living in a world that is trying to devour, you know, uh, us with its ungodly ways, uh, but sweet and tempting ways. Uh, We're living in that sort of a world. No matter how hard we try to, you know, block ourselves, you know, out of that world, the influence is definitely there. Uh, And, uh, you know, uh, we buy into a lot of the lies, you know, of this world. Ultimately, we become slaves. um, And uh, we will worship uh, this world's gods, uh, consciously and unconsciously. And you will make for yourselves idols. Uh, you will ultimately forget how to worship uh, the one and only God. This is the warning. This is the warning uh, that the scripture is giving us. And this is the warning that the the cross of Jesus Christ uh, is also giving us. So then, if you have ears, uh, listen. 
Jesus uh, is the only way. You don't need anything else. Ultimately, you need, you only need Jesus. At school, uh, at jobs, at fa- in, in the family, when you look into the future of your existence, uh, you have to, you must remember that Jesus uh, is the most important uh, person uh, who will lead you to that life, eternal fullness. So that's the message uh, for today. The only God and the only way. Let this truth dictate over your lives and lead you uh, into uh, the kind of living that truly honors and glorifies uh, God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reminder. We thank you for the teaching. We thank you for waking us up. Uh, We thank you for leading us uh, to repentance. Uh, Help us. Help us, Lord, to never forget uh, that you are the only God. Uh, We shall turn to nothing, no other things. You are the only God, uh, that you are the only way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. your benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, love of God the Father Almighty, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.